go ahead and get started. I'm Chris Domes at University of Wisconsin, and today we're presenting the AO Trauma Journal Club, Capitone, the Little Ball of Pain. I'm joined by my uh, associates and moderators here, some people that I look up to and have, I've had the great pleasure of working with, uh, Dr. Nicholas Iannuzzi, as well as Dr. Christopher Doro. We all have some UW affiliation, whether that's Wisconsin or Washington. Um, and then also all of us have lived in Baltimore for our fellowship at some point. So uh, some, some, some blood between all of us here. I'd like to thank my moderators, guys. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, here are our disclosures. Got to give it the three seconds. AO North America is an independent nonprofit surgical specialty society dedicated to improving the care of patients and musculoskeletal injuries. We do not endorse or promote the use of any specific product, service, or uh, uh, service of commercial entities. Uh, equipment used in the course is for demonstration and teaching purposes, and the intent is to enhance the learning experience. Upon completion, here's our learning objectives. We'll give you guys a couple seconds to read those. Here's our agenda for tonight. So we're gonna do a quick case introduction. Then we're gonna go through our five articles. We're gonna to return to our case and then go through it and have some question and answer. And then a little adjournment uh, around 9, 9.15. This is a slight variation in the journal club format. We're trying a different format this time. So any feedback is appreciated. Please put that in the Q and A section or feel free to send any comments about your thoughts to me at domes at ortho.wis.edu. Any of your thoughts on this would be uh, much appreciated or this format compared to some of the previous formats if you were involved in that. Also, if we happen to have any authors you want to jump on and say something, uh, make sure you jump in in the, the Q&A. Let us know you're here. With that, we're going to jump into our case. So here we have a 61 year old female who fell while going down some stairs. She's a type two diabetic with cirrhosis, uh, NASH, so a non-alcoholic. She has a BMI of 44. She's right hand dominant. This is her right side and she lives independently. And this is the x-ray from the transferring hospital. On this lateral view, we see some signs uh, concerning for a capitella fracture with that kind of double bubble sign on that lateral view. In RED, she gets different imaging, an AP, and again, a lateral, which, which once again shows some signs of potential capitellar injury. A CT scan was done at that point, which shows some comminution of the capitellar fragment on these selected views of the CT scan, as well as a small coronoid fracture. So this is what we're talking about tonight, these capitellum injuries. And with that, we're going to jump into the journal club portion. We are going to set a timer for about eight minutes, an article. If we go a little bit fast, that's OK. If we're going a little bit long, we'll wrap up that and move on to the next article. Dr. Seth Leopold has given some kind of thoughts about how to lead a journal article uh, or a journal club. We have, we'll have these questions up. You can also use them for your own journal clubs. With that, I'm going to start out by reviewing the first article here, which is the outcome after open reduction and internal fixation of capitellar and trochlear fractures. So this is a paper from 2006. So really, in this article, what we what the authors were looking at were 10 over a 10 year period, they collected about 28 patients and uh, that were fixed uh, who had capitellar fractures. They developed and devised kind of a different uh, classification scheme, which they have that showed kind of how intrusive uh, the capitellar fracture is into the spool, and then the degree of comminution really of that posterior column. So that was one of the things that they put forth there. In the article itself, then, they described how they fixed the fractures, which is based primarily on a posterior or posterior lateral approach using the Boyd or Coker or Kaplan intervals. They had a large number of these more comminuted posterior column fractures that they looked at as well. They had a very good description of their post-operative re uh, rehab plan and their motion, which is fantastic whenever I see a paper. 
I really like when they describe kind of how they did their post-operative care with early motion and their weight bearing and their normal follow-up. I found that very uh, helpful to kind of go over in this paper to just compare to how I do things myself. They had a quite early motion after about just a couple of days. So they also really then, what this paper did was look at outcomes of these patients. So looking at their range of motion and then their complication rates. And what they found was overall in these patients, they looked at them for an average of around 50 months post-injury is they only had an average loss of motion of about 25 degrees uh, compared to the contralateral side in the flexion extension plane. And then only a very small amount of loss in supination pronation of only about four degrees. They did have a high rate of um, revision operations, and that was for a myriad of purposes, primarily based on olecranon osteotomies, if they use olecranon osteotomies to attack these fractures and perform their operative fixation. They did find in functional outcomes, the patients who had that hot, more highly comminuted posterior column injury had weaker grip strength as compared to the patients who had a more simple posterior lateral column. That's those B, they consider those patients their B, B type uh, fractures in their scheme. Overall, there are other complications. They had a significant number of patients out of their 28 patients. Nine had pretty significant post-traumatic osteoarthritis at the end of their follow-up. Two out of 28 converted to total elbows, and three had osteonecrosis. So this paper, what it brought for me was a good look at kind of the surgical outcomes for capitella fractures in this patient population. Once again, we're saddled with uh, 28 patients over 10 years. It's not a large number of patients, but that's, I think, pretty true for all the papers we're going to see. We just don't generate huge amounts of uh, numbers of patients with these injuries, and that's why they're, they're challenging to take care of. Um, but overall, the functional outcomes in these patients were pretty good, a good arc of range of motion, um, but a high chance that they're going to go on to develop some degree of post-traumatic osteoarthritis, even convert, requiring conversion potentially to a higher level implant, such as a total elbow, and even needing some uh, further interventions, such as hardware removal, um, especially in the setting of uh, electronon osteotomy, if an electronon osteotomy is utilized. Um, Chris or Nick, any thoughts on this paper, you guys, things that you guys took away from this paper? They didn't really have a hypothesis. Um, it was really just an outcomes study and, and, and they showed, you know, a, a good kind of the natural history of these operatively fixed through a posterior approach fractures. Uh, I can jump in quick. Um, a couple of things I liked about this paper. I think, I think this is our best paper of the night. Um, for several reasons. One, it's the biggest uh, group of patients for one study. I think that <clears throat> when you look at their classification scheme, this is the one I like the best. Um, it makes sense. One, two, and three. One being capitellum, two being including the trochlea, and then three being comminution where the trochlea and the, ca and the capitellum are separate pieces. That's very important to know preoperatively. And then just if the, if the uh, posterior lateral column is intact or not, A or B. It's very simple, very straightforward. And I think this system, when, it, when you read it, it makes you think this is someone who actually fixes a bunch of capitellar fractures because the system makes sense and it's helpful for surgery as opposed to that type one, two, three, four, the Heinstein steinfall Coker-Lorenz fragment, broberg mori fragment, and the McKee fra uh, variant fragment, which are really confusing, and they don't really help with planning for the surgery. So I thought that's really good, and I think that um, classification system is the most useful and I think should be used if, if anyone is curious what they could, what would be best to use for their crew. Um, I think the other thing it highlights, unfortunately, is what we're going to, that's going to plague us with all these papers, which is kind of why it's interesting. Um, it's not like hip fractures in the elderly. You're going to have mixed approaches, mixed fixation, heterogeneous um, plans for all these patients. And that's just how it goes with Capitones, which just makes it interesting and, and kind of fun. And I think hopefully by the end, um, people will feel like this was, is an intimidating fracture, but after you've done enough of them and kind of gone through some of this, it, that they're actually not that, they're actually kind of, they're actually kind of rewarding. And I, I kind of don't mind them anymore. That's why Chris fixes a lot of ours in our group. 
Nice. Yeah, I mean, I think it's interesting, look, just looking briefly at the paper and the surgical techniques, like 24 of their patients, I think, were treated through a posterior approach. And, you know, the, the, there's a seminal Gelberman paper uh, in JBGS, I think, out in 1996 or so, that looks at the blood supply of the capitalum, and, and a lot of that is posteriorly. And so, you know, I think one of the dreaded complications is AVN. Uh, they had three patients with AVN in their group. Uh, we'll read some papers tonight where they used a lateral approach and didn't have quite as high a rate. And so um, just something to kind of keep in mind, even with kind of the, you know, the um, Murray kind of type four fractures that include some of the trochlea, some of the papers report being able to get to that side from the a lateral approach. And so um, just kind of things to think about what complications you want to deal with as you address these fractures. Perfect. Once again, if you guys do have any questions, feel free to drop them in the Q&A section. Otherwise, we're going to, with that, right on time here, we're going to move uh, along to our next uh, paper, which is open reduction internal fixation of the capitellum fracture with headless screws. I think, uh, Nick, you have this one? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Chris. So uh, this is an article, 2008, uh, published in JBGS, uh, written by uh, Kenneth Eagle and their group um, on the open reduction and internal fixation of capitular fractures with headless screws. Um, and so in terms of importance, you know, headless compression screws uh, have kind of gained a little bit of traction and, and provide uh, good fixation and good compression with uh, limited exposure. Um, and so, you know, this may also provide a, a method to address some uh, more complicated fractures, uh, specifically potentially type two fractures and uh, with kind of not a lot of underlying bone. Unfortunately, those are the types of fractures that didn't quite make it into the study. Um, so this is a retrospective cohort study. It included 16 patients, 13 females, three males, average age of 40 years old. Uh, follow up on average was about 27 months. Everybody was treated with an extensile lateral uh, approach or a posterior lateral approach. Uh, it was still approached kind of through a lateral incision, and then they would go either front or back, depending on the amount of combination that they had. Um, there were six type one fractures, uh, two type three fractures, and eight type four fractures. Uh, the authors also noted five ipsilateral radial head fractures. Um, most of those, four out of the five, were in type four fractures that involved the trochlea, uh, and then the LUCL was intact in 15 out of 16 patients. In terms of the hypothesis, uh, as this was mainly a cohort study, it really didn't have a hypothesis. It was a description of kind of functional uh, and objective outcomes, uh, as well as radiographic outcomes. And so in terms of key results... Uh, most importantly, union occurred in all patients. Uh, the average arc of range of motion was 120 degrees or so, uh, with a range of 70 to 150. 14 out of the 16 patients achieved what we consider a functional arc of range of motion, which is 30 to 130 degrees. Uh, all patients had full forearm range of motion at the end of the case or end of the series. Um, pain was noted as none in nine, mild in six, and moderate in one. Uh, the authors also used kind of American shoulder elbow surgeon scores, uh, as well as Mayo elbow performance index, uh, and noted a score of uh, 37 on average of the former, and then a 92 uh, Mayo elbow performance index on average with a range of 65 to 100. Uh, they also noted that all patients returned to their primary occupation. Uh, authors noted that type of fracture was not correlated with the Mayo elbow performance index outcome. They found that decreased range of motion was found in patients with type 4 fractures. Uh, the ipsilateral uh, radial head fracture had decreased range of motion and poor functional outcomes, but due to small numbers, the authors noted that it didn't reach statistical significance. Uh, in terms of the question being answered, well, it was a descriptive study, so there wasn't really a particular question. Um, this is still, even with 16 patients, one of the larger series of capitellar fractures, although not quite as large as our previous study. Uh, and these patients received somewhat homogenous treatment. I mean, a similar approach, similar fixation strategies. No one received uh, plates that I was aware of, um, although some patients uh, required additional small fragment screws. Uh, and then they had a reasonable duration of follow-up of greater than a year, so at least long enough to kind of 
uh, see you know immediate complications if not um, arthritis. Um, and then they provided kind of functional outcome scores in addition to just radiographic and objective analysis. Uh, it's still a small study. And then again, this is a, even though it's a relatively homogeneous treatment, it's a heterogeneous group of fractures, um, including patients with radial head fractures. There's an article that I keep on my, you know, desktop pretty much all the time, two articles, really, there's one on, um, Lower extremity outcome scores and one upper extremity outcome scores are both current concepts review and JBGS, and they go through just the different patient reported outcome scores and whether they're valid and have a minimally uh, minimal clinically important difference. And so the ASCS and Mayo uh, elbow performance index tend to rely largely on pain uh, for their outcomes. Um, there's no known MCID, at least back in 2012 when that study was published on um uh, for the ASCS and then the MCID for the the Mayo performance index is 15. So in terms of was this a good question? Well, it's not really a question. It just kind of uh provides a good description of the approach. Uh they noted that no uh patient uh, experienced clinically relevant HO even though some patients had some. So they don't recommend any prophylaxis. And then, you know, you can counsel your type four patients that they may develop some decrease in range of motion there at higher risk of that. Uh, but I can't say that this study changes my practice uh, entirely other than to know, you know, headless compression screws may remain on the table as an option. Um, hey. That's a great review. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Chris. No, I was gonna say any thoughts, Chris. No, I thought that was a great summary. Um, and I agree, if you don't have that little paper that you were talking about that goes through these uh, uh, patient-reported outcome scores, it's really difficult to figure out. Some are higher, some are lower. Um, the one thing I would add about this, so obviously I, I, I'm a big fan of uh, anterior to posterior fixation for an anterior fracture. Um, and Domes and I talk about this all the time. It, it's like hanging the lemonade sign or the stop sign on the post. You'd rather put the nail on the sign side of the post, not on the far side of the post. And that's exactly what they did in this, um, which is, I, I think, our preferred method of fixation as well. Um, I think the only other thing we've changed as uh, than this type, type of fixation is we use bioabsorbable implants, but they're, they're the same headless uh, variable angle pitch um, compression screws. And I think the only advantage of the bioabsorbable is as these undergo avascular necrosis, which some will, of course, this they said they had none, and I don't know if that's related to their um, shorter follow-up. Um, those screws can become proud. And then you can see in the other papers, they talk about needing to revise screws. And I think the biosorbable is a nice compromise for that. Um, we have not had one of those uh, lose reduction yet, although I'm sure it will eventually, but um, but I think it's a nice, it's a nice presentation of a technique, um, not by not our preferred approach here anymore, um, but it is a approach. And I think it's a, it's a, again, with a, Difficult to capture fracture, difficult to get a high numbers, difficult to get homogeneous patients with homogeneous fractures and homogeneous fixation. It's very difficult. Given that, um, I thought it was a very sound um, presentation. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, I think that, you know, it's it's good proof of concept and we've got it so we we can we can use them there you know which exact you know they use a specific type of headless compression screw so i don't know if they were trying to push that one specifically which it works um and, and there's lots of variations of that uh, on the market yeah yeah they referenced another paper you know in terms of doing biomechanical studies on different fixation techniques and they like those variable angle pitch screws but you know i don't think you need to be married to any technique We'll review another biomechanical paper where no one lost fixation, even though one method was clearly superior. So, and that's the crux, right? I mean, what what actually it needs to heal versus what you do to it, and what the screw or plate or whatever system you use can can hold in a biomechanical study. Those are all slightly different things from reality. Okay, we're perfectly on time. We're going to move to the or we're going to move to the next paper.
All right. Um, this is the, uh, oh, you got it up there. Great. So this is a, a systematic review of operative management uh, capitular fractures. And this one did have a hypothesis, which is, I think, the only one of our papers that does. Oh, wait, no, no, the last one does. Um, and this was, uh, <clears throat> it was uh, over a thousand articles that they um, coalesced down to 28 studies that fit their criteria that they were looking for. And it was a systematic review of those papers. And their hypothesis was simply, um, does operative management of isolated capitular fractures lead to better clinical outcomes as determined by functional range of motion, uh, pain, and return to previous level of functioning as compared to closed reduction and immobilization? So that was a pretty straightforward question. Um, and they went in and tried to answer that. Again, uh, not following Domes' list exactly in order, this suffered the same problems that the other ones suffer. Uh, a lot of these are case reports of a single patient, one patient in the whole in the whole publication. And so and so you had um, massive bias, different treatment plans, different strategies, different fixation, different evaluation of outcomes, um, super heterogeneous fracture patterns in patients. That being said, um, they tried to answer this question. I think given what given what is in the literature, I thought they had some interesting observations. So we'll get to it. Um, like I said, they had 27 patients, and so that was a total of 150, 27 studies, excuse me, and that was a total of 154 patients. And these are largely type one um, fractures, sort of that Hans Steinthal type one. The, that's the, the most that they had. Um, so first up was closed reduction and immobilization, which I think is important. And we try that in all the capitella fractures here, um, regardless of the pattern, um, we try a closed reduction first in the OR. Um, and sure enough, they found in their group that 20 patients that un underwent that with five studies, none of them lost fixation and all of them healed and maintained anatomic reduction. And they could not show a difference between the closed reduction crew and the operative crew. Second thing they looked at, which was interesting, was excision of the capital element. I've never tried that or uh, followed a patient that had that. They only had 25 month follow up for those patients, but there was 23 people that underwent that. And those people also had good function other than one person had locking in their elbow, um, which seems somewhat negative. Um, again, you wonder if that longer follow up, would they be able to show more arthritis or migration of the radius or something. But that actually showed a good result compared to the fixation. And then of course they looked at fixation and they had Again, vast mix of constructs, K wires, screws, plates, um, and they all had a, a mix of uh, issues with those, but none that they could show was statistically different other than the K wires did worse in terms of needing for additional surgeries and some loss in range of motion. And the final thing they wanted to look at was predictors of outcome. The only thing they found was age showed better pronation supination. Um, everything else was the same. It couldn't show any difference to follow-up leading to uh, more arthritis um, and they, they couldn't really show any other thing else with fracture pattern or um, fixation used so their 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 hypothesis was not proven and they could not show that closed treatment was better than operative treatment and then even within operative treatment they couldn't really show any differences between screws versus other constructs and the K wires, other than having additional reoperations, they really weren't that much worse. They had slightly worse range of motion, but it wasn't it wasn't statistically significant. So they were not able to show that operative treatment was better for capitular fractures in general. Um, interestingly, they only had about one percent of their view had AVN, even though their papers that they had were that were up to ten to thirty percent. So this AVN keeps sneaking up in the literature, and it's difficult to pin down. And again, it's hard to know based on the approaches and the next paper will go over the blood supply a little bit more detail. And, and uh, Nick already alluded to this, which I think is a key to these fa these fractures, um, but they only had 1% overall. So it, it, it does seem to be lower than I've seen in real practice. Um, any other things, the limitations we talked about, um, I think those are the main key things. Source of selection, the problem, talked about that. Retrospective, heterogeneity. That was all my notes that I had for that one. 
Um, my, Nick, have you done yeah, an excision my... on any of these? I mean, I don't, I've never have. Chris said he never has. I don't, you know, it's like, it's not, you know, these, these fractures, I feel like occur, you know, in the setting of a possible elbow dislocation, uh, you know, with, with other elbow instability. And so, you know, it's like most things you can do it, but it, it's kind of like replacing a radial head. You generally want to make sure you have a stable construct at the end of the day. Um, and so that wouldn't be my go-to uh, early on. Certainly, if you end up with AVN, it could be an option. Uh, you know, we have we have studies that show people can live without radial heads, but I don't know that. You know, I think my my main goal uh, on the day of surgery is to produce a stable elbow, whatever means necessary, and that usually involves fixing the capitellum. And I, I, have you, Chris? Do you, do you ever K wire these? I mean, we use threaded wire, buried threaded wire sometimes, but that's not the K wires that they're really talking about here i think they're talking about more like almost pediatric k wires where they're, they're i think they're doing the yeah skin. i think they're doing pediatric k wires yeah which obviously so that, I've, I've never have no experience with in adults yeah neither do i and i mean i think that's they they discuss why they think the limited range of motion happened in those patients because you got to lock them up for an extended period of time yeah. so i mean that's the same with kids they're talking three four or five weeks as compared yeah. to the operative fixation patients who you generally get moving you know some papers say as fast as two days, some papers say after a week, you know, what, every, whatever your protocol is, but generally not three weeks. You generally get people moving earlier. So I think the K-wires uh, sticking out of the skin, um, I think this paper shows that that's less of an ideal thing just because you to the amount of mobilization that you have to, to, to do to protect the soft tissues and everything around those. Um, I, I mean, I think this paper is a, a great one um, that that does give you some equipoise, at least to try non-operative management in these patients. Yeah. Of course, with that, I think the the onus is on you to follow those patients very closely, though, and to make sure that they maintain their reduction if you are able to obtain a reduction in a closed fashion. So that's very close follow up because um, uh, a missed uh, one of those uh, six weeks after you closed it, you're in a different kind of, you know, for me, you're in a different place than if you catch it at a week or two weeks even. Um, so if you uh, close reduction, at least in my practice is a thing, but that's very, very close follow-up weekly x-rays um, to make sure that it's maintaining a reduction uh, after attained that closed reduction. Yeah, I think, you know, my one concern, you know, with that is that the, the idea of, of closed reduction is based on kind of five studies. Three of those had, you know, three patients or fewer. Two of them had six patients. One had seven. So it's like nobody's going to publish their case series on capitellar fractures that failed closed reduction and management, right? And so the syst these systemic or systematic reviews are, are kind of inherently a little flawed because they're based on publications and uh, there's going to be a certain amount of publication bias. And so, you know, knowing that there aren't any small series in which patients failed closed management is a little concerning um, that are included here. So I, I'm always a little skeptical, but I think it's certainly worth a try. I mean, the, you know, the series of seven patients, all of which were successful, I think lends a little, <laughs> but like you said, that puts the onus on you to really follow these patients closely and be pretty cognizant of small changes in reduction. Yeah, we've had good luck with it here, including uh, post-close reduction CTs um, and then close follow-up. Um, Obviously, we'll present a case today, which we'll see how it turns out. But uh, um, in general, I don't think, I don't know, uh, again, this is 100% anecdotal and uh, not evidence-based. But in practice, we try all of them closed. And, well, you'll see very rarely do they lose reduction. And then those go to the OR and have fixation. So I don't, I don't feel like it's a huge loss for us to do it that way. And we have, I've had many of them return to full full motion um i don't I, I mean we should publish it though you're right yeah, yeah it's it'd be great to have you know somebody that publishes on not only their successes but also the ones that don't work and i think one of the questions i have in the case that you'll present is you know how much do you think the combination played a role and do you guys have better success in fractures that don't have combination with that close reduction method 
that's why we do journal clubs to come up with more so questions and yeah, yeah. <laughs> and stem stem thoughts so um great we're gonna move on to our next paper though so we can stay on time so next so, uh, i think doro you're taking this yeah. one so this one is just kind of a, a cool idea that um i just really like this paper it's really thoughtful um it's not obviously a big heavy lifter in stats um but it it uh I, I think it, these folks had the same frustrations we had with the standard um, posterior and lateral approaches to these fractures. And I think that, and, you know, we, we, start, we changed our treatment algorithm and then I found this paper and I, I realized they had the same frustrations we had. And so this is just a case study, uh, case review of eight patients. So it's a small group. Um, and they talk about a couple key things that I want to go through. Um, number one, they give you a really nice uh, vessel diagram of the blood flow to the capitellum. And we've been alluding to this all night long that this is just a little cap of cartilage with uh, very little blood flow into it. And so you can see that if you dissect on that lateral ridge in the posterior humerus, you are devascularizing this fragment. We know that the upper extremity is forgiving, and a lot of times it does revascularize, and, and we know that to be true. But a lot of times it doesn't, not a lot, but on the order of 1% to 5%. And the patients that it happens, then it's a disaster. The second reason that we are frustrated with these constructs that you were seeing is a lot of the fixation goes in the back or laterally, as the other paper we'll talk about today. And I think the I think the fixation should go in the front. So you should put the nail through the post, through the sign into the post. And I think that's what these guys, these folks were having that same frustration. And so it's difficult to do that kind of hanging upside down in the OR trying to get to the front of the capitellum from a lateral or posterior approach. And so I think a, a neat way to overcome that is to just do a straight anterior approach. And that, that's, they report this particular type of anterior approach, but I've never done this exact way. Um, but I think it's a cool way to do it. And a couple of the key points I want to bring to people's attention is they've got great cross-sectional pictures of the elbow at the level of the joint. And the point one that I wanted to show was you can see on the radial side of the elbow is how close the radial nerve is to the capsule and to the radial head and the capitellum. And then conver uh, conversely on the medial side, you can see that the median nerve and bundle actually has a decent amount of space um, and the uh, brachialis is kind of protecting it. So as you kind of go across on the medial side, you're actually more protected than you are on the lateral side. And I think a lot of people don't realize that. The second thing is when you make your windows from the anterior approach, and we'll talk about this a little bit more um, as the case unfolds, spoiler alert, is <clears throat> you'll see the one window is between the brachialis and the radial nerve. And then the other window is between the brachialis and the median nerve. And you'll see in our, our example, um, and you sh they show really nice pictures of that. Uh, and, and what we found is the branches from the median nerve into the uh, pronator is variable. And sometimes it's nice to just take the nerve radial and go on the medial side of the nerve, the median nerve. But in this example, which I think is fine, is just be, go between the brachialis and the median nerve um, and leave the branches on the on the pronator. But you'll see in our example, we have pictures coming up, shows it the other way around. I want to just make that distinction. But so they show sort of a transverse way to do it with these particular windows. It's very thoughtful, and um, I think you'd have to be very skilled to do it. But it, I like how it shows creative thinking, and um, it shows an incredible understanding of the anatomy. And then the, the final thing I want to mention is fixing these with the arm and extension have a, make, make sense for a couple of reasons. Number one, you keep that posterior and lateral column of the humerus and the capitellum intact. Number two, the arm is an extension, which is a lot easier in surgery to get that capitellar piece back into the into the forearm with the arm extension because you have room to stick it in there. And then finally, you have the biomechanical advantage of putting screws anterior to posterior, which is, I think, way stronger than posterior to anterior. Um, so those are the main things I wanted to talk about this. And they had no AVN. I mean, it's two to five year follow-up, only eight patients. So again, you know was the blood supply impact 
that big a deal or not. I don't know. I think it is. Um, this is how we fix them now. Um, but I thought this was a really nice anatomical discussion and case series, not really a hypothesis um, and that sort of thing, but uh, I thought very informational and sort of thoughtful. I like the uh, kind of the evolution of papers from 2006 to this 2020 paper where they go from kind of a, a very utilitarian posterior approach where you're exposing everything, you can go wherever you want to go to this kind of like surgical strike of a of an anterior approach. I guess my question for you, Chris, since you probably have more experience, is do you get CT scans on these? I mean, these, the ability to, to fix these in this fashion is predicated on a lack of like combination posteriorly. You have to have something to put a screw in. And so what are you getting preoperatively uh, to make you feel more comfortable for this approach? Yep, uh, great question. Um, and I think the, I, I do agree in the CT scan. And I think that if you have posterior comminution, this is a little bit of a judgment call, and your lateral column is still out to length after the ER splint or whatever the patient's in, we've been, we've, and it's, you know, below midline of the distal midline to the uh, capital, we've been continuing with anterior fixation only. If the posterior comminution certainly goes above the waist of the capital proximally, and or if they're shortening of that lateral column, I don't, I think you should supplement with something more than just A to P fixation. But I think just any push or comminution is not a contraindication. So the B type dub release, it's got to be a B plus, I would call it. So shortening or like, you know, above half of the cow tone, because you can drop your hand and get in the top half and still get it. Yeah, I think that's just super helpful to be aware of. I mean, before anybody goes out there and tries to do an approach like this, really understanding like what limitations you may find. Because once you've made this approach, you probably aren't going to want to back up and make a different one. I mean, it's, um, and so, you know, making sure that you have your ducks in a row beforehand is going to be key. Yeah, the the crux, I think, to all of these and what these papers show is there there's, there's different actors in these capitellum factors. Yeah, how much into the trochlea it involves, but then also is the lateral column intact or not? How much comminution of the lateral column is there? Those are the things that you need to do your, like you said, get your ducks in a row to make sure that you know so that you can attack these correctly surgically, either anteriorly or laterally or even posteriorly. There's a number of papers we didn't show them here, but in reviewing this, the, the really standard is if there is concern for a capitellar fracture, a lot of people advise getting a CT scan or some advanced imaging of this, specifically, you know, a, a CT primarily um, to, to evaluate these fractures so that you can quantify that amount, not really quantify, but so that you can fully accurately assess the amount of comminution or involvement of the, the lateral column as well as the trochlea. I think that's the standard of care, at least at our institution. Uh, Nick, is that the standard of care at your institution? Yeah, I won't think I'd do these without a CT scan, at least at this point in my career. Um, you know, I think if you are going to take a different approach where you have more extensile, you know, opportunities, then, you know, potentially, and, and maybe that's required in an institution where a CT scan isn't available, you know, but uh, in more limited resource places. But I think, uh, in my hands, my go-to would be uh, a lateral approach for a number of these, um, uh, unless there was, you know, like a large trochlear involvement probably that I couldn't get to. Perfect. Great. Uh, we're going to move on because of timing here, but that's a great paper. All these have been really good so far. Here we go. Our last one, then we're going to get back to our case. Uh, Dr. Iannuzzi, I think you got this one. Yeah. Okay. So this is optimal fixation of the capitular fragment and distal humerus fractures. So like when stuff really hits the fan and you, you have a, an unstable uh, lateral or medial column, uh, the senior author was John Scalaro out of UC Irvine. Um, and I think, you know, it's an important question in that, you know, when stuff does hit the fan uh, and you've got the added little bit of a capitular fracture, it's kind of nice to have a, a plan or an understanding of what uh, the biomechanical uh, ramifications of your construct may be. Um, and, you know, I think at least in my hands, I've, I've used orthogonal plating and parallel plating, just depending on the, the distal humerus fracture that I'm dealing with. 
Um, I think commonly there's a belief that more points of fixation uh, is important. Um, and these kind of, you know, once you've done your approaches for these two plates, you have the opportunity to use either kind of a posterior lateral plate or just a straight lateral plate, the parallel version. And so it's nice to know kind of what's going on. Um, so the study design here, this is a cadaveric study. They used 10 match pairs of humeri, six women, four men, uh, ages 59 to 75. They used a three-hole medial plate in every specimen. Um, they placed locking screws in the two distal most locking holes. Um, and then they created kind of their uh, osteotomy. Um, and then they used either a four-hole posterior lateral uh, locking plate um, or just a straight lateral plate. And they used uh, either three locking holes placed posterior to anterior in that posterior lateral locking plate or two locking screws and then the, in the parallel construct. Uh, they loaded the, the cadavers at 20 degrees of flexion and then they used video tracking to determine displacement and evaluated for stiffness. Their goal, the hypothesis, was to compare stiffness of orthogonal versus parallel plating and simulate a distal humerus fracture model with a separate capitellar fracture. Their key results uh, essentially were that parallel plating was uh, over twice as stiff as orthogonal plating. I think one key thing to note, though, is that neither construct was noted to fail uh, under the loads that they were presented. So I think the authors answered the question. They said that they answered to a degree, and we'll get to that. Um, but they, you know, in terms of strengths, they created a replicable injury. They had controlled conditions. They had uh, a cadaver study, so that provided an appropriate comparison. Um, and then they have, you know, biomechanical data for a specific but uncommon uh, injury pattern. I'd say the weaknesses here is that they were purported to be trying to address, you know, OTA or AO. Uh, 13C3 fractures, which would be like kind of complete comminution of the articular segment. Um, but in reality, what they created were kind of a B3 uh, version, and then they, that's what they were testing. And so more specifically, kind of that Brian Murray type 1 fracture, um, it doesn't really evaluate for comminuted fractures, doesn't address the healing of the fractures. Um, and neither construct was noted to fail, so it's it's not really known what's needed to get things to heal. They didn't talk about which side was chosen, which, you know, we know that uh, bone mineral density may be higher in, in, in dominant limbs if they're used more. Um, and um, so those were kind of some of my issues. And it doesn't evaluate fractures that may have less concilis bone, like the Brian Murray type 2 fractures. Um, so was it a good question? Well, I think it can provide some guidance in specific incidents instances of uh, common distal humerus fractures involving the capitellum. Um, it may have some uh, limited applicability, but it does kind of contravene some conventional wisdom of more points of smaller fixation, which I thought was was nice. Uh, having a, a screw kind of directly across the capitellar fragment uh, directly underneath the plate was stronger than kind of the, the points of fixation from P to A. Um, and then it doesn't really address specific fractures tested in the study because sometimes you might just use a headless compression screw. And so we don't really understand if that would be stronger or as strong as some of these constructs. Um, so does it change my treatment? Uh, maybe, you know, I might be more apt to use a parallel uh, lateral plate, although that's going to be determined by kind of the orientation of the other fractures as well. Um, and again, neither plate construct demonstrated failure fixation. So, um, you know, I think it's uh, I think it's an interesting paper. Uh, it's it's not super groundbreaking, but I, I think it's you know they clearly showed a difference in the two, so that's that's kind of why it's helpful. Chris, what are your thoughts? <clears throat> this is a great. I'm glad you picked this paper because it kind of shows um, different opinions, and I think John Scalaro, Scalaro and his crew are excellent clinicians and researchers. But um, I think this paper is confusing because they wanted to look at C-type fractures um, and they ended up testing B-type fractures, which is interesting. And so you wonder, <laughs> would the capitellum behave differently if there was a fracture of the entire distal humerus or not, which is what they're the question they're asking, but it's not the question they tested. The other thing that's interesting is it's almost like this circular reasoning thing. It's like, well, we'll just check an isolated capitellar component 
And that's not, a, as uh, I agree with Nick completely, that's not the contract I would use to fix an isolated capital, capital component ever. I would never use a medial plate on isolated capitellum. So again, it's this circular reasoning like, well, we can simplify it down to a B-type fracture, even though we're concerned about C-type fractures, but then you end up using a plate that you would never use for a B-type fracture, you would use, this would be interesting if they, like Nick said, I agree with you, if they tested headless compression screws or K-wires or other things that people typically use for capitellums. And you see that in this, the X-ray they show, they show a C-type fracture and then, but again, that's not what they tested. So it's, it's this weird circular logic where it's like, you sort of find yourself testing something that you weren't set out to test and then ends up showing something that we don't ever do in clinical practice and would never need to know. <laughs> Um, I also think the other notes I wrote down was I think this ideal fracture that they cut uh, isn't really what you see in clinical practice. Um, I, I think you rarely have this nice, beefy, metaphyseal uh, subchondral bone to grab onto from a lateral and medial plane. That's almost extremely rare to see. Um, and but I do I do like the point it's saying that you know be careful when you fix things from the wrong side and we see this all the time in femoral neck fractures you're putting a screw in the greater choke to try to control the femoral head so we know this is this is a fraught plan um, we know that that's difficult and so it, it makes that point again it's like it's still a problem and we get that that's why I think A to P screws are better um, but there could be times where you can't get A to P screws and so it's good to have additional things to think about. Um, those are my main, and again, that whole clinical versus biomechanical strength. I mean, it, if it's biomechanically stronger, does, is it, does it make a clinical difference? I don't know. Um, but my biggest concerns were, this is not how I would ever fix this fracture. They needed yeah. one more osteotomy to make it applicable. <laughs> I to I totally agree, and it would have it would have changed the whole the whole thing of it. That's why I mean, it's good to show it because like this 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 is how this thing gets presented to us. And then we should call John and get him on the, we should get him on the thing here and see what he says. But anyhow, <laughs> um, yeah, I agree. If they would just would have completed what they said, it would have been a totally different view of it and, and maybe different results. I don't know. Um, it's just interesting how these things kind of this rabbit hole circular logic thing happens, but that's, it happens all the time. Yeah. That's perfect guys. Um, with that, and to keep people's uh, time in, in in time in mind here, um, that'll end a uh, review of these five papers, and we'll jump back into our case. So for our case here, and you know, summary again, we've got our sixty-one-year-old with this capitellar fracture, and what do we do, uh, obese patient? Uh, what I did was I took her to the OR and I performed a uh, or attempted a closed reduction. And so here's me extending her, uh, you know, changing the forearm rotation, putting my thumb over that capitellar piece, popping it back in. And afterwards, I thought I had a very, uh, very acceptable, reasonable reduction. And so we splinted her up and immediately uh, post-op. Here's her immediate post-op x-rays here. After our closed reduction, I thought we had a good, great reduction of that capitellar fragment. Um, so we we're gonna try a closed reduction after a, uh, or try to treat her closed. Of course, like we discussed, you know, this, this, this can work um, in that paper that we reviewed earlier, but it is the onus is on you to follow these patients up and follow them very closely. And so that's what I, I did. And one week later, she came back to clinic. We got our lateral x-rays and it spit right back out. So at that point, uh, we have our, you know, now our, our piece, which has failed closed reduction, spit right back out. Her, her splint doesn't look different. Doesn't look like she, you know, extended through this or really moved that to, to cause this. So not really a failure on her part, just a, a failure for the bone to hold or a failure for me to, to go and pursue operative management. Of course, then I'm going on vacation. So, uh, so uh, Doro is good enough to, to take this back and he later uh, he takes her back uh, for uh, open reduction and internal fixation, a ligament repair and reconstruction um, of the capitellar piece. And this is his images, uh, not uh, after the surgery, um, which Chris, you, you like to use a bioabsorbable or, you know, um, 
yep. uh, implant as compared to a, uh, a metal implant. They they look like the regular metal variable pitch screws. They're just they're just bioabsorbable. Yep. They look the exact same as what you're thinking of. I don't want to use any company names. They look the exact same. Yep. Other thing too, and, and Nick, you mentioned this. Uh, I I think our biggest uh, failure patients for this particular thing and all elbow cases are is obesity. And I don't know what it is about it because the splint looked fine. The reduction looked fine. Um, and I think for anyone else viewing this the supination and extension, and that's a perfect reduction. Um, but the only ones that we've had fail, it's not the combination. It's not, if it's the trochlea, if it's reduced, it's reduced. Um, it's, I, I, it's been obesity and I don't know why. I don't know the mechanism. I mean, I I don't know. I, I, I mean, the splint looks fine. I don't know what it is. It's just their mobility is more difficult uh, and they use their arm more. I'm not sure. But those are the ones we've had fail has been obese patients. So this Chris, with... Yeah, oh, I would just sorry. say this video is not this patient, but is the exact same approach. I just don't want, because this is not an obese arm. So I just wanted to make that clear. I was going to say, yeah. Yeah, no, it, it, <laughs> it's the exact same arm. It's the exact same approach. It's just not this patient. This patient failed close reduction. Yeah. So this is a this is a video that Chris was able to take of his approach for these anteriorly. Good. Okay. LABC, biceps, brachialis, and then traversing distally the cephalic. Mm -hmm. Okay. Brachioradialis, brachialis, radial nerve, and you can see beginnings of joint capsule. It's going. Okay, so you can see the interval and you can see the capitular fracture. You got it? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, uh, biceps, brachialis, brachialis here, median nerve, cubital vein. And That's the trochlear the, side of the uh, fracture. Trochlear fracture. Started. Okay, this is your, how we're going to look at, and then you can see here is the fixation on the capitellum. Mm -hmm. And you can see here is the fixation on the trochlea. Thank you. So great video uh, from Chris and then the, this patient, which is not our patient, but early motion uh, video that shows how, you know, that getting them moving quickly, sutures yeah. still in. Yeah, it's less than a week. We move them less than a week. Avoiding varus, staying in the frontal plane with their motion. And then rotation and full flexion, and then we just limit their extension to 40 degrees and then 10 degrees for a week. So she's just, we're just showing her, you know, this is just her post op instruction video thing. I imagine you've done that anterior approach a number of times now. How long does it take you at this point? I don't know, Dones. What do you think? I mean, we do it under one tourniquet. I don't, I, I don't, wouldn't say it's fast. I mean, um, I'd say 90 to 120, you know, it's, it's, um, like it just, it's more relaxing. I think because it's just that the arms and extension, you're just looking at it. So you're just, you just find, you know, once you're comfortable with the two windows that that video shows, and again, just to, just to rem remind you guys, the, the paper talks about going on the other side of the median nerve. And I think that's a lot of times true because it has big branches. You saw in that case, it did the branches were fine. We we're able to go on either side of the nerve. So I kept the nerve with the artery, but sometimes you want to go between the nerve and the artery, the median nerve I'm talking about because of those branches to the, to the uh, pronator. But that, that one didn't have it. So you just have to be a little flexible with that, that side of the window. Um, I, I'd say 80% of the time we don't need the medial window. I just start working on the lateral window and like, well, we can't, we can't get the choke of their thing. And then just go to the medial window and just dissect down, get that window. And you can see, you can see, you can see the trochlea just fine. Yeah. So our patient at six months is pretty good. hundred degree, 105 degree range of motion arc, uh, lacking some soup, uh, but good pronation here in the obese patient that we did a little bit of HO that you can kind of see forming around there decided not to go any, any further with that and just did aggressive uh, therapy in motion.
When you splint these patients, I know it's for a short time, but do you splint them in any particular position, supination or neutral or? Neutral, we'll go close to 90. Okay. You know, maybe like 80 degrees, not quite 90, a little bit less. Yeah. Doug Handel always taught us that supination is always the hardest to get back. And as we yeah. know, it's also the hardest to compensate for. So, um, you know, obviously I don't treat a ton of these, but we, he taught us to splint a little more in supination, but that's probably a good idea. I just feel like the, the injury occurs in supination. So I'm always like a little bit worried that if you leave them not quite fully flexed in supination, you're increasing the, the, the ability for that thing to squirt out. Yeah, that makes sense. In this particular pattern, but I, I agree with everything you said. If you guys have any questions, otherwise we'll just uh, some last comments and, and get everybody um, out of here so that we're on time. Overall, I want to thank my panelists or you, you guys for reviewing these articles. It was, uh, I think, a really good journal club. Slightly different format. If people do have comments or questions about the format, please email me or uh, email the AO and let us know your thoughts on this specific format that we did here tonight. Um, I think it was more of a, uh, our goal was for a journal club style kind of in-depth look at these these papers. I think we were able to achieve those and achieve our objective, which are listed here. Um, any any closing thoughts, uh, Dr. Doro or Dr. Iannuzzi on this? I would say I think just uh, proper planning is very important on these, good imaging, and then having a good approach uh, for fixation that addresses the problem that you have detailed with your uh with your plan whether that's anterior posterior capture your fragments um move them early any thoughts nick or chris no i think you know i mean like as we've seen from the all the studies these are uncommonly seen and they can be very complicated and so like you said like i think the majority of this case is in the preparation understanding the approach that you're going to need to take and then planning your fixation uh, appropriately. And I think if you do those things, you've set yourself up for as much success as possible. And then just be kind to the soft tissues. Yeah, I think those are great points. Uh, it's always interesting, you know, we have sort of what you would consider or a statistician would consider terrible literature on this fracture, but patients don't know that. And if they get injured, they get injured. And I think uh, I, I echo exactly what Nick said. Um, your approach should be as favorable to the biology as possible, and it should be as favorable biomechanically as possible. And then it, you should be focusing on patient function, which is exactly what we're all striving to do. And I think, yeah, you know, each year we'll hopefully learn more about this fracture. It is very, it is very tricky, and, uh, but it can be rewarding. And you just gotta figure out a comfortable pattern, a comfortable treatment algorithm that you can accomplish for your patients and stick to your principles. With that, once again, thank you so much to my panelists, just for everybody else. Um, make sure you keep up with AO and all their social media. Um, for a public service announcement, just uh, you might not receive emails for a while specifically, so make sure you keep up with the Facebook or Twitter or this other social media ways that AO gets you information for upcoming webinars and firesides. Keep looking at that. Uh, we have our case folio as well in the AO network. Uh, make sure you check that. And then once again, check us out on Spotify, YouTube, and Apple Podcast. This uh, recording will be up in 24 hours after the conclusion of this session thank you so much everybody thank you uh to my moderators hey guys thanks so much uh nick and and doro um for your thoughtful comments and with that we will end our webinar <laughs>